Hey, everybody. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited. I like doing these weekly, like, web workshops where we get to chat with you guys and talk gardening for an hour. It's always fun. <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to be talking about indoor seed starting, uh, specifically starting peppers and tomatoes and other warm season stuff. Yep. So as you can see behind us a little bit, we've been uh, doing a lot of seed starting. We should have counted how many seeds we oh, have. Oh, I should have. But I have it all logged in the app. Yeah, we're, we're over a thousand. There's for a sure. lot. <laughs> <laughs> we're having fun. We're starting like every single broccoli, every single pepper that Park Seed has. Like we're, yeah. We're Let me just fun. like show you our garden in the app. Pass. <laughs> so you can see. So this is our indoor seed starting area right now. Of everything we have going in the garden, so we are we are stress testing the app right now, seeing how well it handles a ton of plants. So that we're, today we're going to be talking mostly about the warm season stuff. Um, if you've missed some of our other workshops, we've done this over cool season already. We've done this over herbs. We've done this over some other stuff that we've already started. So check those out. Um, you probably found us through the app, so you already know about it. But if not, you can download the app I just showed through the QR code up in the top left. It's an app that we built after we started learning how to grow food. Let me pull up a picture and show you. So this was our garden whenever we first started growing food back in 2015. And a couple years later, you can see we kind of convert our entire yard over and we got obsessed with growing food and we built our app to make it easy for other people to do the same thing. So our app calculates planting dates based on your nearest weather station, Let's you log and track all of your plants, has all the growing information like companion planting, yeah, square pest foot, management, yeah, square, square foot, foot gardening, gardening uh, days of germination. That's the kind of stuff we're looking up a lot right now is how many days it takes to germinate some of this stuff. Well, and, the app calculates this out whenever I put it in our garden. Yeah. It says the dates that I should be expecting it to germinate. And we'll show some of that more here in a little bit, but let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, I also want to say we're doing a, a giveaway today, so uh, leave a, a question or a comment in chat, and we will pull from from chat uh, a winner, and you'll win a free subscription to the Seed to Spoon Premium version. So this comes with unlimited plants, unlimited chats with Growbot, full access to all the features, including garden themes, and there's a uh, task free shipping. view. Free shipping with every purchase. That's an, an, another big... Yeah. That's if you're yearly. The yearly membership comes with free shipping. That, that's what we're giving away today, though. Yeah. So, without further ado, let's jump in and talk about warm season. Do we introduce ourselves? We didn't do that, did we? Uh, kind of. Sort of. I'm Dell. This is Carrie. <laughs> Our names are down there. That's, oh, yeah. That's yeah. got to be good. Well, we're backwards, though. Yep. We switched. Usually, yeah. we switch sides. So. <laughs> I know. This feels weird. I feel like I should be looking this way. Let us know. <laughs> Throws you off. Oh, we talked about this already. So, yeah, that's the giveaway. Okay. So, yeah, first of all, we wanted to start, like, why should you even care? Why do you want to grow, Why do you want to start your seeds indoors? Um, there's several reasons of why you would want to get started with seeds, at least a lot of our reasonings that we do. We love to include the kids in our seed starting. They help us pick out these unique varieties that maybe you don't necessarily find at the big box stores or the nurseries or, you know, just all the local places you look. Like, there's so many unique varieties of seeds out there, and... There's so many fun ones that the kids just get really excited about. I get really excited about. So I love finding these unique varieties and including the kids in all of it to getting them excited to go out there and garden. Um, and always I say too, like you are getting a, a seed packet for, I mean, I don't know, like four or five dollars and then versus one tiny plant for four or five dollars. Whereas with that one seed packet, you could start like 20 of those plants, you know, or how many ever you have in there. Like it's, it's incredible the amount of um, money that you can save overall with just the seed packets and buying transplants. Yeah. And like she said too, um, you get a lot more variety. So if you buy a tomato from one of the big box stores, it's going to be one of like maybe 15 to 20 different types of tomatoes that they care, which sounds like a lot, but when you get down to basil, they have fewer of that. And when you get to broccoli, they have even fewer. It's going to be like, if well, they even have it, I feel like sometimes yeah, they might have two varieties of broccoli. If they have it, um, 
Whereas if you start your own seeds, you have a lot more variety in what you can choose, what types of plants you can grow. You can find varieties that do well in your specific region and focus in on growing those. You'll have a lot more success. You'll also have healthier plants that are started from seed in your own seed starting setup because you're not going to pump them full of fertilizers the way that a lot of the stores do. Um, you're going to take the time to make sure they're being watered correctly and all that kind of stuff too. At least hopefully you will. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so those are some reasons why, um, why we think you should start seeds. I mean, we need to make this like big screen here okay. so they can I see it you. a little bit better. Okay, there cool. We go. Yeah. So like we said earlier, there the app will make it easy for you to know when to start your seeds too. Um, this is probably one of my favorite features. I always say that too, but it honestly saves me so much time and frustrations because I, I don't want to do math in my head. I don't want to count backwards from my frost date as to when I should be planting and all that. So the app does all that for you. So there's several different ways that you can see when you should go about, um, planting them out. So the first screenshot there, that's on that main screen. Whenever you first open up the app, there's that dashboard view. Um, and it'll show you there's the let's grow section up there, which shows what you can grow now out of all of the plants that we have in the app, things that you can start now. And then also there's a toggle that you can switch to, which is plant soon too there. So that's pretty great too. And then there's also the, that planting calendar. I know you mentioned that earlier for the premium users, there's that planting calendar where you can see it visually as well. Um, and then also we have a filter too on the main growing guides sections for just the plants that you can plant now. So that's another way that you can go through and find which plants you can start now. And then also if you're just looking at the plant details screen, it'll also give you exact dates too. So you'll know how long you have until you need to switch over to planting outdoors or when you can get started doing things. And then last but not least, there is a task view too. Under your My Garden, that's where you'll find your task list. So these are ones that you have started as, as your favorites. And then you will pull up like when it's time to start them indoors, when it's time to put them outdoors, when it's time to harvest, all of that. So I really like that screen too. I wanted to call out that too. So lots of ways to know. <laughs> Okay, so seed starting supplies. As you can see behind us, we have a mixture of things. Um, but my very favorite that I have is this biodome right here, which you'll see on the screen too. But this is the Park Seed Biodome. I absolutely love this because it is super durable, very high quality. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing. We did a test with a bunch of farm animals with like our chickens running across it. We even had our dog go. A big dog, a great yeah, Pyrenees. Like a great Pyrenees, like standing on it and it didn't crumble or anything. It was awesome. Um, but they're they're amazing. Like if you ever have difficulty with germinating seeds at all, this is the system that you need to get because it it just makes it a lot easier and um I mean, honestly, foolproof. <laughs> I, would, I don't want to say that, but for me, at least, that's how it's been. Like, before we switched over to these, like, we would always plant, like, two to three seeds in each hole. And then um, these ones, like, I only have to put one seed in now. Like, it makes a huge difference. One of the things, actually, I'm trying to explain that. One of the things I love the most about the biodome is the way that you plant. So, there are these little sponges. Trying to get one out of here. These little sponges here that are completely sterile and these are what you plant in and it eliminates a lot of issues with mold and fungus and that kind of stuff and if you've ever dealt with seed starting mix and having to sterilize a whole batch of it in a day and spending like <laughs> i think two days going through of batching of, of sterilizing seed starting he speaks mix. from this last week we we were having to do that <laughs> yeah uh, you will appreciate the, the sterileness of it and how much easier it is. <laughs> yes, so, and also mess-free too, especially for the kids, like having them involved with the seed starting area. Like I don't have to worry about them getting like all dirty. I can do this in like the kitchen or in, inside somewhere. Um, so I, I really like those too. So we also have these trays that are made by Bootstrap Farmer. And again, these are super high quality, durable trays, like these little mm -hmm. things here. Can you hold this for a second? So normally, 
like if you like squish this, it would it would crunch in and it would break on the ones that you buy from the store, like the cheap ones. These are made to reuse over and over. And that's why we use these. We've used Bootstrap products for a long time, way before we even carried them in our store. I also love there's all these different colors of them. We use for color coding and stuff like that. But they're super durable. And we they, so these cells here are little six cell, six pack things right here that we put seeds in. Uh, we do a lot of seed starting in these as well. Um, the, our kind of philosophy on what we do where is the, the more difficult seeds we're starting in a biodome because it's, they typically do better. We have more success in the biodome. The things that are pretty easy to, to start, like lettuce and broccoli and kale, cabbage, all the brassicas, they germinate pretty quick and they're pretty easy for the most part. We'll do those in the six packs, but the biodome, we have one of around here somewhere of oregano and rosemary and lavender and all of these herbs they're typically pretty hard to germinate and we got like 95 percent success rate germination on them so um yeah th that's the the main different the main supplies that we use as far as what the seeds go into as far as lights are concerned there's a couple different options if you're just going to be growing on a small scale the picture that we have over on the right here shows what we have inside of our house over in the kitchen area and this is one that we sell through the app it's the it's the qr code actually right up in the top right you can scan it and get to this and, and, and buy it from there and this is one we keep inside this is great for just, you're just going to be starting like one biodome then that's that's all you need uh, we are starting thousands of seeds here. It's, <laughs> we're trying to grow every single variety that we carry in the app of not necessarily tomatoes, because that's a lot, but for all the broccoli and lettuce and all the brassicas, we're growing every variety, uh, every variety that we carry in the app. So we have to do it on a pretty large scale. So we have a lot of shop lights that I bought um, and just hung them from shelves that we made. Now, the key on um, hanging them like that and using shop lights is it's a pain in the butt if you use chains and you have to constantly adjust. We did this for like a year <laughs> where we're constantly adjusting chains and it falls and then the little S clip falls down and it's just, yeah. it's infuriating. So um, the key instead is to use these retractable rope hanging lights and do you have a qr code somewhere on those or? i do it's it's gonna be in the future though okay so i'll out. call it out again but when we get to that i'll show you and they allow you to adjust the shop lights to like raise or lower them mm -hmm. so that's a big key now when it comes to like i know it can be really confusing when you start looking at grow lights because there's all these different strengths and colors and all these different things when it comes to seed starting it's pretty simple you just need like a shop light with a standard daylight color bulb. Um, you don't need the multi-spectrum or any of that kind of stuff, the full spectrum. You don't need any of that stuff when it comes to just starting seeds. That is mostly used whenever it's growing a plant all the way to harvest. That's whenever you need the full spectrum lights and stuff like that. So hopefully that answers most of the questions on supplies. Let us know if you have more questions um at all on that kind of stuff we'll, we'll come back to it okay and then a few other things too that of course you're gonna need to germinate your seeds if you don't have the biodome and use those bio sponges then you'll need some sort of seed starting mix that go into your little seed starting areas and we have one that we like is the coconut core and that just comes in like a little brick and you put it into some water and then it expands. It's uh, it's pretty cool. And then... Uh, and then we have this seed starting mix from Espoma yeah. that we keep in these little like bus trays from Sam's Club is where I, is where I keep a lot of this mix. But um, you can buy that through our app too. And we have deals we've run on that recently on the seed starting mix. I don't know if we have any coming up. Check for it. We have a shout out to our Wow Wednesday deals that we have every Wednesday where we have a really good deal on something. And the Espoma mix, I think it was a few weeks ago that mm -hmm. we had that one. So check it back every Wednesday. Check to see what um, what we have as the deal because it's always going to be something that's worth it. I promise. It's, a, it's always yeah. a great deal. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, the coconut core comes in a brick. Did you talk about expanding that or anything? Uh, just briefly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's really simple. You just soak it in warm water and it expands and then turns into seed starting mix, basically. Um, the seed starting mix is going to be better because it has vermiculite in it and it helps regulate moisture. The coconut core works as well, but it's not going to be as good as the seed starting mix. And then, of course, this question comes up all the time is, do you need a heat mat? Um, so I will say, so for all pretty much the warm season things that we're starting, so tomatoes and peppers and some of the warm season flowers as well, those things we like to use a heat mat for. Um, so... As you can see right here, we have that picture with our tomatoes. So we do have a lot of tomatoes and peppers and things like that. Like we were talking about all of the seeds that we're starting. So we have them all lined up on the heat mat while they're germinating. And then as soon as they are done germinating, as soon as they've popped up, then we remove them from the heat mat and put them just on, you know, regular wood or shelving or wherever underneath the grow lights. Um, and then maybe we'll start another round and put them on the heat mat again. Um, but we pretty much just use the heat mat for our warm season and when we're germinating. And we do use a dome while we're germinating as well. So yes. you can see the dome. Uh, the biodome comes with the dome. Obviously, it's in the name. But <laughs> the uh, the other seed starting ones that we have, we have domes that fit those as well. We So every time when we're germinating, we use a dome and then we take the dome off. Now, the biodome does have these vents at the top. Um, so what we'll do with those... Oh, cool. Great question, <laughs> Stacey. So the way we use those vents at the top is once our seeds, uh, if we have like maybe half of them have germinated, we'll open the vents up. And then it's kind of a, just a middle ground between taking it completely off. And then, and also like sometimes if it's just really humid in there, like sometimes I'll vent it to, um, mm -hmm. I'll also just like once a day, typically come in and take the lid completely off and just like get some fresh air in there and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, the app does give you information on what type of sun environment that plant likes as well. So it'll, whether it's full sun or part shade or all that, that's one of the, the features of the app. And that's one of the completely free features as well. That's in, in every plant detail when you go into it. You can also filter plants by what kind of sun they like as well in the plant list. So if you go to filters in the plant list, you can filter by the ones that like shade or all that kind of stuff as well. And then a question here about the biodome. Um, you can start seeds that have different germination periods in the biodome. We try to keep things to where they're similar, but like right now with our peppers, we have some where we have a row of habanero in there that have not germinated, but all of the other peppers have because the hotter, hotter peppers take longer to germinate sometimes. So, we're probably going to move those sponges over into a different biodome and then like, kind of rearrange a little bit. So uh, sometimes you end up having to do that, but it's easy enough just to pop the sponges out and move them over into something else or however you're going to handle that. But we or try you can just and just pot the other ones too. At that yeah, you can also do that. We did, but we try and keep things together as far as things that require the same temperature to germinate and then also amount of time to germinate. Um, those are the two things we try and group together by. It'll make your life a lot easier too with like the, the, the lights. Cause you want the lights to be like right on top of the plants while they're germinating. And if you have to have them up higher, but you have smaller plants and maybe some taller ones, like the smaller ones won't quite get as much and then they'll start to get leggy. So, yeah. Yeah. And don't just listen to us on the bottom. Lisa says here, too, she has a <laughs> germination. Yay, Lisa. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about first. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the different plants that we're starting now. We're not going to go into too much detail on these. We actually did a whole hour on tomatoes not too long ago where we talked about all the different tomatoes we're growing this year. Um, but we are going to talk about some of the specific things about starting seeds for these. So um, on tomatoes, so there's two different types of tomatoes. You have bush tomatoes and vining tomatoes. Bush tomatoes are going to grow up to three to five feet, put out all of their tomatoes at once, and then maybe one more round, and then they're done. Vining tomatoes are going to continue to vine all season, and they'll grow until it gets too cold for them, and they'll put out tomatoes until it gets too cold for them as well. 
So those are the two differences between types of tomatoes. Um, bush tomatoes are going to be like the Romas, the San Marzanos, things like that. Vining tomatoes are going to be the Better Boy Hybrid, things like that. The Cherokee Purple Heirloom, Whopper. the Parks Whopper. Yeah. I was going to say Whopper. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. And then the Cherry Tomatoes. I love yeah. those. And the Junior Whopper. There's a new Junior Whopper now as well. So... Starting seeds on tomatoes is relatively simple. We typically do use a biodome for it just because we like to do like a biodome on anything we're putting on a heat mat. Just makes it easier. Um, the key on tomatoes really is to not start them too early, I would say, because I made a mistake once of starting. I got really excited. I started my tomatoes in January. And then by March, I had these giant tomato plants. I was trying to lug around and take inside, like take outside on nice days and then bring back inside. It was just, it was chaos. It was a lot. They were very tall and it was just unmanageable. So uh, don't start your tomatoes too early. And that's the main reason. Um, and then you have to deal with like fertilizing, but you don't want to fertilize too soon when you transplant. Like, yeah. Up potting several times. <laughs> yeah. That's annoying. I always hate up potting. So. Um, so follow what the app says, the dates. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, but there really isn't anything too specific to, to tomatoes when it comes to seed starting. They're relatively easy to start. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else we need to talk about with tomatoes? Um, I will say whenever you're up potting and transplanting, you don't have to be super careful about like, I know some plants you can't bury the stem at all, but with tomatoes you can. So that's something that's unique with tomatoes. Yeah. And that is one of the things we'll do with tomatoes is whenever we up pot them into a larger container, we'll fill that container like only halfway up when we plant it. And then as the tomato grows and gets taller, we'll eventually bury it to where half that plant is now buried because all along the stem, it'll make new roots and you'll have a much stronger and healthier plant. So that is one little trick with tomatoes is to when you up pot them to only bury them like halfway and then just keep kind of like you do potatoes where you heal them as they grow. Same type of thing with, with tomatoes. Makes them stronger. <laughs> okay. So I think that pretty much covers tomatoes. Peppers are going to be very similar. Um, you're going to start them on a heat mat. So both tomatoes and peppers are going to start way easier and faster on a heat mat. Peppers can take up to like 20 to 30 days to germinate if you don't use a heat mat. If you do, it can be four to seven days sometimes. So, so that's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, relatively simple. Just once they germinate, take the lid off. And then um, one thing... We'll get to this later, but one thing, especially with tomatoes and peppers, is to make sure you have a fan that's blowing across the area that keeps the air from getting too uh, moldy. I guess is what I'm looking for. You know stale. what? Yeah, stale. That's the word I was going for. Like, um, some of our favorite varieties of peppers. Uh, you can't go wrong with just a straight up jalapeno. We always grow a lot of those. Um, there's also mild versions of jalapenos if you have kids. Uh, one tip I'll give is we use color coding when it comes to our labels for peppers. So the ones that are too hot for the kids where they shouldn't be touching them at all, we'll make, we'll make red and then make sure they understand what that red label means. So that's one thing we do with peppers when, when we're seed starting is we are co color coding them. Mostly because if, if your kids get the hands on them and the hands in the eye, it's an ordeal. Well, it's happened before to us. Like we speak from experience because our yeah. daughter loves to just go out and snack in the garden like all the time. Yeah. And she went out there and she's like, ooh, this is nice. And, and took a bite of the jalapeno and yeah. drink a lot of milk. We drink a lot of milk. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess if you're struggling to get your kids to drink milk, that's one way to do it. <laughs> um, again, the hot peppers are going to take longer to germinate than the other peppers. So if you have them together in a tray and then the hot ones aren't germinating, it's Probably still, it's probably okay. It just takes a little bit longer for them to germinate. 
And then we are also starting some flowers right now. I'm so excited. We actually have what three of those bootstrap flats and yeah. flowers going right now. We just planted out a bunch last night too. I'm so excited. So we have a variety of things. So some of these things are, so pretty much again, a good rule of thumb is if these plants are ones that grow over the warm season, there are going to be ones that you can use a heat mat on um, and that you probably want to look at using a heat mat and then other ones. So if you have like a cool season, so like the calendula and um, those ones, you won't necessarily want to use a heat mat on. So again, just think about, is it a warm season, cool season? And then that'll help you with the heat mat. And all the seed packets from park seed also on, on the back of it have the optimum temperature for germination. Mm -hmm. So that's what we go off of a lot. Um, Park has always been known for having a lot of the best information when it comes to germination. There's a book called Park Success with Seeds from like the 60s, I think. It was one of the first books we got when we started gardening and we started learning about like seed starting and stuff because it was considered like the, um, the pinnacle of information on this stuff. So the seed packets will have all that on the back. This is our first year doing a lot of flowers. That we're starting. We've always like bought flowers. We've never started our own flower seeds. I know. I'm so excited. So, <laughs> I can't wait. So we're we're growing quite a few flowers. We're geeking out. Yeah. We're having arguments about how we should organize the zinnias. Hey, let us know in the comments what you think. <laughs> so Carrie thinks we should organize the zinnias alphabetically. Yes. So it's easier to find the zinnia variety that you want. My thought is we should do it by color because we want <laughs> to plant out the, the garden in a Roy G. Biv fashion where it's the art red, green, you know, like that whole... <laughs> Would have like rainbow, yeah. <laughs> so that's our strategy, and but she still wants. So yeah, let us know what you think <laughs> as far as which way we should organize the zinnias. We are not starting zinnias um, indoors yet because it's still a little too early. Also, they do really well just starting directly outside self seeding, and you'll find that on a lot of plants that they do better just starting outside outside when it's time for it and. And they're really quick. Like squash, we don't ever start indoors because it takes like four days to germinate once once the temps rise. And it does a lot better like that. Same with pumpkin and all these other ones, watermelon. We don't really start any of those indoors. It's mm -hmm. just going to be the things like peppers and tomatoes and some of these other things. Well, that... I will say we did start loofah indoors. And that's just because we want to grow the loofah all the way to the sponge. And that's that takes yeah. a while. It's a really long growing the season. Fruiting. Yeah. So that's one we wanted to get a head start on. So on some of the squash, like some of the winter gourds, it might be worth it for us. Mm -hmm. Like the birdhouse gourds and some like that. We should look at those to see. We got three empty trays. So I guess we <laughs> no. We've been saying that until we were up to like twelve thirty last night. Yeah. Planting seeds yeah. and it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. We have fun. We had a good time. Check out our Instagram stories. We posted some of that stuff. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about some of the most common mistakes. And these are all we have made all these mistakes. That's how, so that's how we know they're common. We verified it, did yeah, our research for, for you. For sure. Made them all. Yeah, so it's definitely things that we've done in the past and things that I hear from other people as well. So, I, um, one of the first ones that I wanted to call out was over here was a picture of Dale actually watering our seed starting mix. Um, whenever it comes in, in that Espoma bag, it's amazing, but it is super dry. So you want to make sure that you water it. So that way, whenever you plant your seeds in it, and then you go to water, the water will actually like drain through and it'll be moist. It won't just stick, like stay on the top, or it won't come up the, the from the bottom if you have it super dry like that. So it's really important to make sure you pre-moisten all of your seed starting mix. Yep. And there's like a balance because too much water is also yeah. a problem. So like in that bucket, I've got a bunch of holes drilled in the bottom. And then I'm going through and filling it with warm water and mixing it with my hand until it gets about the right consistency where I can like wring it with my hand and water doesn't soak out. And then I stop. And then, um, and then we try and use it pretty quick after we do that because we don't want anything to develop while it's in that. So, uh, which kind of leads into one of the next biggest mistakes, which is overwatering um, or underwatering. But typically it's overwatering because you're trying to baby these plants. And I've made this mistake a million times myself, so I completely get it. Um, whenever the seeds are germinating, you definitely want to keep them moist. Like until, But once they sprout, you need to start backing off. And the way that I handle it is um, these trays that we have, I'll kind of pick them up and I can tell based on the weight how dry they are. Like, or how heavy, like if they're heavy, then they're really full of water. If they're really dry, then they're going to be really light. And if they're light, I will set them down 
and I have like this big tray over here of water that I set them down in and then they soak up water from below. Now on a smaller scale, like these bootstrap trays have it where you can just like pour the water up underneath each tray. Works great for doing two or three trays. If you have as many trays as we do, it gets annoying having to haul water back and forth and do all that. So I just like take them up, pick them up, put them in these big like pans that we have, like these big like rabbit dropping pans we got from like PetSmart basically. Um, or tractor supply. And then they soak up water from below. They'll, uh, I'll let them soak for 20 or 30 minutes till they're fully saturated. I'll take them out, put them back in the in the seed starting container that they're in. And then I'm not going to water them again until they feel like they're starting to get light again. So typically it's like two to three days. I've got to do that. Once the, once the seeds get uh, larger and start taking up more water, then obviously you're going to have to water um, more. So it's a, it's a delicate balance and you'll kind of get a feel for it. Um, another one of the things you saw on the top, right? You see a picture of a fan. And that is because one of the biggest mistakes is not using a fan or having air that's circulating because one of the biggest problems you'll run into is mold and that can be prevented by using a fan or, or something like that. Or gnats as well. Yeah. That can help with that too. And then lastly, uh, not sterilizing your equipment. Uh, so this, the, the styrofoam for the biodomes, the seed starting trays, all of that kind of stuff go through and you don't necessarily have to use bleach. It definitely helps to use like a bleach solution. A lot of people swear by just using soap and water. It's good enough for dishes. It's probably good enough for this too. Um, but just make sure you're washing them. You're not like have, if you have residue from the previous planting on there, that's bad. Don't do that. Um, I just typically use hot water and soap and let them soak, soak for a little bit and then give them a really good rinse and we're off the races. So, and then another common mistake that a lot of people will do is hardening off or not hardening off at least. Um, so you'll see, we have a uh, picture down in the bottom corner of some of our bootstrap trays that are just sitting outside on a little field trip out to the garden. So what you want to do whenever your seedlings are ready to go, you want to just gradually increase the amount of time that they get outside, gradually increase the sun exposure, just gradually get them used to the environment that they're going in instead of just throwing them out there. So it'll help to just give them a lot more success. Yeah. And it, and so the first day you take them out, it'll be like an hour that they're outside. Mm -hmm. The second day will be two hours, expose them to some yeah. darkness, some wind, some rain, all the different things they're going to encounter. Yeah. So over a course of like a week or two, then you'll be ready to transplant. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about some of the other things. Um, and this really could tie into common mistakes too, I guess. Yes. Yeah. So leggy seedlings are something that can happen from time to time. And over on the picture on the left, you'll see those the seedlings that look very stretched and scrawny. <laughs> um, that is an indicator that the lights are too far away. You need to move the lights closer to the plants. So that's something to look out for there is leggy seedlings. Um, it's a really simple solution. Just move the lights closer. Mm -hmm. Check to see if you have a light bulb burned out. That's happened to us before in leggy seedlings. Was we had a bulb that was burned out, didn't realize it, and that's yeah. how we found out. Yeah. So here, I know we were talking about those adjustable hangers earlier. Um, so though that picture over on the right is showing our shop lights that are hanging up to the top shelf. And then we have those adjustable hangers right there that we just pull on to make them taller, or you can release them too to make them shorter. It's super easy and uh, it makes our life so much easier having those adjustable hangers. I love them. Okay, so again, preventing mold issues kind of goes along with some of the key things that we were talking about, the mistakes of not sterilizing your equipment or not watering from below or watering too much, um, and then also just not having a fan. Um, so if you do notice mold issues, something that you can do is if you were watering wrong before, make sure you switch it up. Don't water from the top. Make sure you add a fan or some sort of air circulation. And then some things that you can do to help with mold is by adding just like sprinkling some ground cinnamon on top or using a hydrogen peroxide spray mixed with water. Um, that can help too with the mold. Um, I know some people will say too, you can go through and just scrape it gently off with a butter knife. We've done it before, but that's terrifying. 
like because you, you don't want to disturb the roots at all with your seedling. So yeah, I would try everything else first. And again, sterilizing your if you're reusing seed yeah. starting mix, sterilizing it between uses. And then I mean honestly, especially if you, if you do, had issues with mold. Yeah, if you do that, like you, you should be fine. And if you, if you do that and you're watering from below, you should be fine. Yeah, and not leaving it sitting in too much water. So if you do water from below, make sure you don't put in so much that it just sits in water all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the same issue as well. So again, very similar with damping off. It's just, this happens whenever your seedlings are just sitting in the moisture too much. They're not growing. They are not doing a good job. So these ones, you want to make sure that you are, again, not giving them too much water and also having a sterile equipment that that's nice and clean, having a fan. And I, I can't say enough about having a fan in your area. It's such a easy way to go about preventing so many, uh, so many issues. Sorry, I'm trying to keep no, track of chat and, yeah. and this. It can be hard sometimes. <laughs> um, okay, yes. So gnats. I know we talked briefly earlier too. So sometimes if you have um, like water sitting down below in your seed starting areas, things like that, you can have gnats that are attracted to those areas. So again, by if um, one thing that you can do whenever you water is water from below and then 30 minutes later go and dump out that tray so that way the water isn't sitting there just breeding all of the gnats um and then of course having a fan i know i said it a million times i'm going to continue to say it but having a fan will really help with gnats and then if you do have an issue just simply again adding a fan will help a lot, but you can use things like the ground cinnamon. You can use some diatomaceous earth is helpful for this as well. And then these yellow sticky traps are also really good at um, catching these gnats if you have any gnat issues inside as well. Awesome. All right. Okay. I know we kind of whizzed through that, but does anybody have any questions? I know we, I saw, I saw some coming up as we were, Going through. I've got some pinned here. So okay, me... cool. Okay. So, uh, if you've seen the news the past couple of weeks, um, there's been quite a bit about this new GMO purple tomato. Um, and the question is whether or not the purple bell, bell pepper started out the same way. And no. that uh, The purple tomato is the first GMO vegetable available to home gardeners. Uh, before that, there were no seeds that you could even buy that were GMO. The purple bell pepper just came from standard hybridization that's been happening since we started agriculture 12,000 years ago, where you take one plant of one type, one plant of another type, and you crossbreed them and you get something new. Um, that's the way we've done agriculture for a long time, until recently, with this new tomato. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to be one of the first people to try it, I guess is my thought on that tomato. Um, I'll let other people try it and report back how it works out for them. I think we already have hundreds of tomatoes on our list of tomatoes we want to grow. The Cherokee purple is purple enough for me, and it's an heirloom. So, like, I'm fine with that as my purple tomato. I don't need um, – so, I, you know, I see both sides of it. Um, but I – again, there's plenty of tomatoes I want to grow. I don't, I don't need them to invent new ones for me. <laughs> Um, we have such a long list of tomatoes that we need to grow because we're trying to grow every variety in our app. And to, I still look at the list of tomatoes. Yeah, Park, like Park City has like a hundred different varieties of tomatoes that are available. Yeah, and it takes like, a lot of space to grow that many tomatoes. Yeah. I'm gonna. So many of them are ones that I'm so excited about too. But we. Yeah, yeah I gotta build all these gardens, <laughs> so it's it's a lot of work, you know. <laughs> um, okay, a question here about if I don't do anything with my garden from last year, where all the vegetables come back this year. Some of them will. Cilantro, if it just like went to seed and, and came down, it'll come back. Lettuce and all that kind of stuff. If you let it go to seed and the seeds drop, they'll come back. Garlic will come back. Onions. There's a lot of stuff that will come back. Tomatoes and peppers will even come back if you had seeds drop. So it really just comes down to what you did with your garden last year. If you cleaned everything out or if you let, if you let it all go to seed and drop, then you may have stuff come back. Now, I will say on tomatoes and peppers – 
You don't know what, because they were probably hybrid, hybrid seeds. And hybrid seeds are pretty unreliable as far as like the seeds that come from those plants. You don't know what you're going to get out of it. So that's one caveat on the seeds that come back year to year. But if it's cilantro, go wild. That's what we do is we have an area out there where it's just cilantro, just a whole patch of cilantro either going to seed or popping up. So a question here about the optimal temperature range. So every seed is going to be different. Again, on the back of the park seed packet, it has the information on there for the optimal temperature for that uh, for that seed. Um, there's also charts online. We need to add this as a feature in the app. I was thinking that during this workshop is that these be one of the next features we add. I like that idea. Yeah. Because um, up until now, you know, I, I've just been either using a heat mat or not using a heat mat, but I just got a thermostat for my heat mat. And I've been using that and really trying to hone in on exact temperatures um, to have better germination on some of these hotter peppers, especially. So, um, so check out, like, like I said, the, the back of the seed packet is going to be the go-to resource on the ones that are, that are bought from Park Seed. It'll have all that information on there. And you know it's real, real because they do all the testing there in South Carolina. There's a, a woman named Annette out there who tests all the seeds herself and has this whole elaborate setup. And she's been doing it very scientifically for a long time. When we went out there, we, we visited with her and saw the setup. And that comes from her specific research and, you know, and a lot of that goes into it. And so there's a lot of really good information on specific um, temperatures and stuff for germination out there. Um, so we covered this issue earlier. Um, probably going to be lack of airflow. Um, or watering too much and from above. Yeah. And if it's an indoor greenhouse, like, so if it's like a greenhouse inside of a garage, like one of those grow tents, definitely like if you're not airing it out or if you don't have airflow in there, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. So it's probably what's going on. Uh, we talked about lights a little bit earlier. I'll revisit it again, though. We we use shop lights because we're growing on a very large scale. We're growing thousands of seeds. We need a lot of space. Um, if you're growing on a small scale, though, um, Carrie's going to pull a picture in just a second to show you a tabletop grow light that we carry in our app um, right here. Nope. Wrong, wrong slide. One. Right here. There it is. The one on the right. So this is one that's great for just one biodome or one seed starting area. Um, it's adjustable. These little things you can... Yeah, there's can, like little bolts on the side that you like tighten and loosen just to adjust the height of it. Yeah. Makes it easy. Um, question from Lisa. We do not heat our garage, but it is very well insulated. And we're in Oklahoma. So it like normally... Our garage really doesn't get below 60. Unless like we get... A couple weeks ago, we had that really cold front come through. It got down into like the 50s in here probably. Um, we had a space heater going during that a little bit, I guess. But that wasn't for the plants. That was for us. <laughs> yeah, because we were out here a lot. Because so. <laughs> like the tomatoes and peppers are on the heat mat. They're doing fine. The cool season stuff likes those temperatures. So, um, so yeah. Okay, so question here. What do we do when we are almost outgrowing our biodome, but the hoop houses aren't quite ready yet? Okay, so at this point, you're going to have to plant them up. And that's what we do is we just had to do this last week with our some of our peppers that were in a biodome. Uh, not peppers, it was broccoli, broccoli. brassicas that we did this on. Because we up-potted them into four-inch pots. Can you reach one of those over there easily? I'll show this on the camera and show kind of what it looks like. So we also sell these. These are other bootstrap products. Again, look, look how. Oh, here. I'll, I'll make can, you. Okay. So go. these are like super high quality. Again, like I'm trying to crush this. I can't. I'm actually squeezing hard. I'm trying. <laughs> um, so the sponge just goes right inside there. So this is just seed starting mix. And I made a hole for the sponge. Pop the sponge down in there. So this is what we up pot to. We also have larger ones that we up pot to. I try and avoid having to go larger than this because I hate having to up pot, I, especially more than once. So I try and time everything where I don't have to do that. But that's typically what we do whenever we plant things up from a biodome before they go outside. The, uh, the plant now is for your area. So we use your nearest weather station to calculate the 
most probable last frost. I think last frost is a relative thing because it changes year to year, but we calculate based on the last 100 years of data what the most probable last frost is and then work the dates back off of there. You can change that last frost date in settings. If you want to make it something different, you can change that. That's no problem. And all the adjust, all the dates will adjust for you based off of that as well. Um, there's no an, there's no like affiliate link for the Biodome because we actually work for ParkSeed. Um, ParkSeed acquired our app a couple years ago. We've been working, uh, we now work for ParkSeed. Like Carrie does a lot of the marketing for ParkSeed um, on social media and stuff. So um, there's no affiliate because we that is us. If you buy through the app, you, you're supporting us as well. So um, there is a 15% off code though that you get that you can use through the app. So Spoon15, if you shop through the app, you can use that. And that'll get you 15% off on the Biodome. Again, uh, yearly memberships, you get free shipping on all orders too. So that'll cover all of your spout, like Biodome refill sponges and seeds and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's, especially for like grow lights, that's an awesome deal on some of the heavier stuff. Oh, so. yeah. So GrowBot works. You get three questions a day if you do not have a premium membership. And if you have a premium membership, then you get unlimited questions a day. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop and um, announce our winner. And then we'll circle back and, and answer more questions. So I think, Andrew, you have a winner picked out. Let me come up here. All right. And our winner today is Casey Ludlow. Ooh, congratulations, Casey. Congratulations. Email us at info at cdespoon.net. And we'll get you set up with your one-year uh, membership, uh, your premium membership to the Seed to Spoon app. Again, that's going to get you free shipping, access to all the features. Um, yeah. Congratulations, Exciting. Casey. Okay. We're going to answer some more questions here. We'll, we'll run up until 1 o'clock for sure. So we've got 13 more minutes. Um, shout out from Amanda here. She's been using the app. Thank awesome. you, Amanda. Uh, one second. And pop that up. Okay. So I don't have a heat mat or grow lights, but I do have a sunny area and cling film covering my seed cells. I keep my house at 73 and I underwater the cells. Yes, this will work for germination. For actual growing, I don't know. Um, it's going to depend on what it is. We just did a test the other day with microgreens where we had some on the windowsill and then some under a grow light. And the difference was out, as astounding. If you go look at our Instagram, you can see a couple days ago. It was a ago. sunny window, too. Yeah, south-facing, yeah. full sun all day. So it's just tough to get enough light off of a window. Now, it may end up working. You may, like, something, I bet lettuce and spin, like, the, the, the plants that don't require full sun, you're going to be able to pull that off with. Like I said, lettuce, kale, spinach, maybe. You'll be able to do that. I don't see a tomato or pepper handling that. Um, and especially it's going to be too cold, like on that windowsill. Like it's just, um, I don't think it's going to work for peppers and tomatoes, but for cool season stuff, for sure. Uh, they do have really small grow lights and stuff though. Yeah. Um, so that might be an option. I was just looking at our windowsill the other day where we tried the experiment thinking, can I fit a grow light on the windowsill? <laughs> so. Okay, so a question from Stacey. The difference between uh, the biodome and the regular planting trays. Mm -hmm. The sponge is the biggest difference. The quality is another big difference. Now, these bootstrap trays are very high quality, and um, you're going you're gonna to have good success out of, out of them. But a lot of these seed starting trays that you buy that are the cheap ones are going to do great once. And then you're never going to be able to use them again because they're going to fall apart. Just trying to get the seed out oh, yeah. is going to make that thing crumble. And then it's it's not going to work. I remember that. It was such a nightmare dealing with those before. Yeah. You're I just, so frustrated. I hated indoor seed starting because <laughs> yeah. of it. I, I didn't even yeah. know that there was something like this before. Yeah. So that's the big, that's one of the biggest differences. Um, also, the quality of the lid, the plastic is, is thicker than a lot of the other domes, and it traps the heat and it traps the moisture better than 
a lot the moisture is the same, but the heat is a lot is a lot different between that and the other domes. The venting on it yeah, also I was makes just about it. To say, I love the venting on the top. Yeah. You can let air flow in, let some moisture out. And so those those are the biggest differences. And really, I mean, the time savings of not having to deal with seed starting mix and just the sponges is really nice because we've been, again, starting all these seeds the past couple of weeks. A lot of my time has just gone into sanitizing soil, getting soil ready, getting it all, like getting all the, the seeds starting to mix and all that kind of stuff in there. So that's been a big part of what I've had to do is just that. Yeah. So the bottom will save a lot of time and effort and messiness. <laughs> Elizabeth has a great question. How do you know when it's time to up pot? So we go off of the roots. The roots tell us. So in the sponges, when you see roots coming out the well, maybe sides. Have, maybe these lettuce might have some. Where are roots. they? It's right behind you. Uh oh, okay. Let me see if I can pop one out. So I bet you these look good. Lettuce, by the way. Isn't this pretty? Check it out. So these are the lettuce transplants. I'll just hit the mic with it so you're hearing the lettuce too. <laughs> yep, there you go. See these roots popping out? This one is pretty much at the point where we will up on it. Or we'll like with these outside. lettuce, we're just going to pop these directly outside. Um, we'll just transplant those directly outside, especially because we have our greenhouse little covers, our little mini hoop house covers, which if you haven't seen those, check out our any of our socials. We've been posting about them a lot. And we can plant under those a little earlier even than we could. But with lettuce here in Oklahoma, it, uh, it actually is... Um, it actually is the right time. Uh, question from Deborah. Yes, you can increase to 12 months and, and then get the free shipping. So if you're on monthly now, you can upgrade your membership through the app and then that will get you the free shipping. Um, if you have any issues at all, reach out to us through support. We'll, we'll get you set up. Ooh, favorite cucumber for Park Seed. Ooh, there is a mini one. Oh, what's it called? The pickling one? <sighs> It's a, uh, no, it's like, oh gosh. I don't know. I haven't looked at, at cucumbers now for a year. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't started cucumbers yet, so we haven't really, I mean, there's a Parks Whopper cucumber. That's going to do really well. The Market Moore cucumber is really popular. That's one of the most popular ones that you'll find. Um, Straight Eight is another really good cucumber that we've grown in the past. Oh, this was the one I was saying, Mini Me ones. Mini Those Me are Organic. Su super cute. Yeah. yeah. We're really getting into pickling, even yeah. though Carrie hates pickles, but she likes pickled other things. So yes, I just don't like pickled cucumbers, pickles know. and mustard. She hates both of those things. Yeah, but I like pickled onions and peppers. Like those are good. I, know. I don't know. There's yeah. something about. I love the taste of cucumbers though. Like fresh, <laughs> they're amazing. So Landon wants to know if we're going to have another pepper game. <laughs> Maybe. <love> it. <laughs> so if you aren't familiar, last year. Um, at other seed companies, there were some peppers that were sent out that were the wrong pepper variety. They were like in the wrong bags or whatever. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but people thought they were growing peppers and they got banana peppers. And I tried to tell people banana peppers are still good. Like you can still yeah. use them, but yeah. yeah, it was a whole ordeal. Again, that did not happen with Park Seed mm -mm. or if you shop through our app. So you will get the right seeds if you buy peppers <laughs> through us. And yes, another good reason to start your own peppers. I love it. <laughs> um we do have a podcast it's called why we grow it's been a little bit since we put out an episode but we're going to be recording some more here soon mm -hmm. and it's basically just us usually just carrie um chatting with someone else that also grows food about why and just talking yeah, about just talking about yeah random gardening just real conversations with real people and, and yeah. some gardening a lot of gardening stuff mixed in just kind of like very informal, like we're doing, like everything we do. I don't think we have anything that's formal. <laughs> well, it's more fun just to sit and chat with you guys. <laughs> um, question about peppers. Um, I have it set to 85 right now, um, but I want to have it to where I have an area that I can set to 90 for the really hot ones and then 80 or 85 for the more mild ones. Um, and again, all this information is on the back as far as the right uh, germination temperature and all that um we do bring plants in over the winter um not as much as i would like to i would like to this year like actually overwinter a pepper for the first time because yeah. you can do that with peppers and not really tomatoes that'd be hard 
but peppers you can easily overwinter. For and sure. Yeah, and we plant most of ours in smart pots, which they're if you haven't heard of smart pots, they're they're these super strong, durable fabric raised beds or containers. And then most of them have these handles on them too, so you can just carry it inside. They're amazing. So yeah, we should we should do that. Just bring our smart pot inside. Yep. We have not used the biodome for flowers yet. Um Mostly just because we have so many peppers and tomatoes and stuff going. But we will be, once we're done with all these peppers and tomatoes and we've got them up potted, then we'll be trying to bio them. And a lot of it, too, is learning because we don't necessarily know what the hardest to germinate flowers are yet because we haven't germinated a lot of flowers. We've germinated a lot of vegetables in our lives, <laughs> yeah. of gardening lives, but not flowers. So we're learning what what the difficult ones are going to be, and then those will be the ones that we start in the bio more and and all yeah. that. Currently so. we have them all in our bootstrap ones. We have like three different flats full of flowers right now. Oh, this answers Stacy's question. We're going to let you know, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard the same though. You know, but like things like lavender, I know it's traditionally very difficult to, to germinate and that we, we did start that in the biodome. We actually did a biodome mm-hmm. full of herbs which have flowers. So technically, yes, we started flowers in the pile. <laughs> we did oregano and rosemary and lavender and thyme, sage. What else we do? I think that's what we did. We just did a few varieties of like lavender too. So that's yeah. what took up all the space. Which was exciting. And it was exciting. Like those are so hard to do. Like we've tried them in the past. We've never had any success. And we grew them all like successfully in the biodome this year. It was so exciting. I was very excited. Um, we do have a, a computer version of our app. It's uh, available via web browser. So it is app.seedtospoon.net. I'm going to put this in chat. One moment. So app.seedtospoon.net. Okay, I just put that in chat. And that is the web version of our app that works from any device that has access to a web browser, whether it's a computer or Kindle Fire, or anything like that that we're not on the uh, on the other storage for. And it syncs with your account in the Seed to Spoon app and all that, too. So, Wendy, I have good news for you. Um, Carrie's OCD is making it to where every <laughs> flower that we are planting, she has to add into the app because she doesn't want to create a custom plant for it. I have a list going right now of, I don't know, at least five to ten yeah. flowers that I want to have. So I'm going to have to pill her off the keyboard tonight because she's probably going to be entering flowers into the app all night so she can log them because it's driving her nuts. It is. That she can't log her flowers yes, in the app right now. we started now. a whole bunch last night and yeah. I was I couldn't log them all and I was like, ah. I told her she can just make a custom plant, but she said, no, if I'm going to do that, then. I might as well just make it for everybody. Yep. So, so good news, Wendy. Lots of flowers. <laughs> now here's kind of our own internal rule that we've set from the beginning with the app was the only things in the app are either flat or either edible or medicinal. The good news is you can find a reason that literally every plant is medicinal in some <laughs> way, shape or form, it seems. Well, yeah, like pretty much every flower, like I'll Google, I'm like, can you eat a zinnia? Yes, you can. <laughs> it's great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I can put it in the app. <laughs> so we're just going to be eating flowers all summer. But <laughs> hey, I'm going to try it. It'll be good for my diet. Yeah. Just a nice little zinnia salad. <laughs> <laughs> okay um favorite sweet pepper from sharon do you know off the top of your head oh there's a rainbow mix <laughs> of course <laughs> where's michelle is she in the comments does she have a joke about you in the... <laughs> oh man um i i don't remember what the actual variety of it is called but i know that there is a petite color one that is a it's a sweet bell and it has like a bunch of different colors that it grows it's so pretty that's actually the picture that i put just because i love it so much here let me go back i put it in right there that's that's (laughs) that one that i was talking about just now i love those ones they're super pretty um yeah i know that's another one sweet pickle is also really pretty too it makes this huge 
huge, like almost bush like. Oh, and then there's a new one we're trying too. That new Easter one. Oh yeah. It's technically an, called an ornamental one, but they're still edible. They're just super pretty edible ones. Um, and they're supposed to be sweet peppers too. I'm really excited. We haven't grown them yet, but we started seeds for them. So I will let you know how those go. Sharon it is on my list is to build a hydroponic system. We have a shop area. It's like, I've got to get our outdoor garden all situated, but that'll be my summer activity when it's too hot to be out there in the sun. I'll be in our shop working on that. I also want to do some, um, some stuff where we mix in the fish a little bit and everything too. So I have an old swimming pool. But I'm not going to clean out again because I cleaned it <laughs> like three years ago. I spent like a whole week cleaning it and the kids swam in it like once and they were bored with it. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm putting fish in this next time. So, okay. Well, I think we're at one o'clock. Well, I know we're at one o'clock and I think that we are out of questions. I'm looking to see if we missed your question, please leave it in the, in the chat after and um, we'll circle back and get it. So, as always, really enjoy these Tuesday workshops, hanging out with y'all. And what are we talking about next week? Put you on the spot oh, again. Oh, man, again. You said it last week. Remember? Yeah. Was it transitioning? the? What was it? I think it's hardening about off. hardening off. Hardening off our cool season plants? I think that, I, I think so. I don't know. It's a busy season. We're focused it on is. one week at a time. I, right I'm, I'm working one week at a time right one now. One day at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't think I can pull it up that fast. Here, okay. oh, I'm working on it right She's here. She's getting it. I got it. I got it. She's got a spreadsheet. I do. I have a spreadsheet of them. Okay. Yep. Hardening off and transitioning cool season crops. Okay, so we're gonna go into all the details about how to take your seedlings and get them outside without them dying. <laughs> That's really what we're talking. That about. is important. <laughs> yep. That's what we're talking about. All right. Well. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate y'all joining us. Congratulations again to our winner. Hopefully and we'll see you all again next week. Same time, same place. Yeah. Oh, check out Garden Themes. We just released a new update. Oh, yeah. That shows, um, that, that has a new Garden Themes feature we released where we grouped plants into collections based on themes. So there's like Pizza Garden. And I do have garden. to call out there is a rainbow-themed rainbow garden, garden as well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And we picked, we went through, we handpicked these these varieties and they're specific varieties for each purpose. So we're really excited about that new feature. I have to pull up this one question. I just saw it pop up. Yes, most of them are. So we're actually growing a rainbow candy crush that I'm really excited about. It's technically an ornamental again, but yes, a lot of those, like the, you, you can read in the description of Park Seed and find out if it is actually edible too. And most all of them are. I had, I had to call that out. If you ever need to sell a seed to Carrie, call it a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> she will buy it. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. This was fun. And yep. we'll uh, we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Bye, everyone. <laughs> see ya.